Hello, dear friends, and welcome to episode seven of uh, the Socmetician podcast. Uh, this really genuinely is episode seven after the little naming uh, mishaps I've had in the last couple of episodes, for which I can only apologise. Yeah, I'm getting a bit older now and the brain's not what it was. Um, welcome back to returning viewers and welcome to new people. It's a. Uh, <laughs> I always make myself laugh. One of the most awkward parts of a podcast, of recording a podcast, is, is that moment when you've pressed the button and you're waiting to say hello. I always want to leave a few minutes, uh, a few seconds of, of empty space so that there can be good edit points um, when I'm tidying things up later on. So I sit there waiting and I think, right, do I just grin and say hello or, or what do I do? I remind myself, um, who doesn't love uh, Angela Lansbury? in Murder, She Wrote. There are... <laughs> I always love Angela Lansbury and Murder, She Wrote. Um, in some of the later episodes, the ones where she couldn't really be bothered to feature in them, but she, it was still her programme, so she had to kind of frame it, they used to do this thing where uh, she would greet viewers to camera. Um, and it was always like she'd be surprised, and she'd be doing something, and she'd turn to camera with something like, oh, there you are, uh, and go into it and start talking to people. And I kind of always feel a little bit like that. My issues, I need to let them go. So welcome. How have you been? Uh, I have been incredibly well. Uh, I've been incredibly busy, as always. Uh, my chaotic life comes into play quite a lot. Um, uh, means life is never boring, which is great. Um, I've, I've been doing all sorts of different things, some of them knitting related, so there's actually more knitting related content uh, in this podcast because of my roundup being all uh, knitting related, or essentially all knitting related. So let's crack on. Um, after I last recorded, so after I'd finished putting the finishing touches to the last episode and editing it and started it uploading, I... I had that became, I didn't realise it was going to be at the time, but it became one of the longest days on, on record for me. Um, and not just metaphorically, but genuinely and act actually as well. Um, after I finished chatting to you chaps last time, I went to do another uh, Singing Waiters event. This was at the, uh, the RAC Club in Pall Mall. The RSC Club, for those of you not in the know, is somewhere, it's in, it's in Mayfair, it's incredibly posh. Um, it's, a, it's an old gentleman's club, and I think they've only recently started allowing women in. I mean, this is really not my kind of scene at all, but the client was uh, um, the, the son of an 80-year-old woman, a woman who was turning 80. So we were going to be going to sing for her. Now, I'm not going to lie, our act is kind of in your face, and... The couple of times that we've done them for really rich people in the past, really posh people, it hasn't necessarily gone down so well. <laughs> it could be seen to be a little bit lowbrow. These people were so posh. They didn't move their lips at all when they were talking. Oh yes, it's absolutely lovely to see you. Oh gorgeous, darling, it's lovely, yes. So nothing was moving at all. They all looked like they'd been Botox, but they hadn't been Botox. They were just very posh. Um, and I had a sinking feeling about it. I thought, this isn't, this isn't going to go down terribly well. So I was dressed as a waiter, and I was handing around some canapes. I had a little tray with some little puff pastry things on it. And I went over to uh, the, the birthday girl, who was not what you might imagine from an eight-year-old woman. She was tall, elegant, distinguished, sophisticated, graceful, um, fabulous hair, sparkling white and a long emerald ball gown, incredibly uh, graceful as I say, and everything she did was sort of in slow motion, nothing moved out of place, everything was wonderful. And I went over to her as a waiter, she didn't know we were there, we, we were hired as a surprise for her by her son. And I went over to her and I said, good evening, would you like some canapes? And she just looked at me and she went, no, no, we haven't had our drinks yet. That told me. Um, it's very, very interesting how people's attitudes often change when they realise you're not... Oh, I stopped myself just in time. You're not just a waiter. Now, I use the word advisedly because I don't think anyone who is a waiter is just a waiter. 
we are human beings first and foremost, but the perception can be that you're just a waiter, and that's certainly how I got treated. Um, there was one guest who was wearing, without any sense of irony, a monocle. Actually, a very old gentleman with a monocle. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, of course, yes, <laughs> absolutely. It was extraordinary. I've never been in quite an environment like it, and I knew the gig wasn't going to go down terribly well. Um, throughout most of it, people were just sort of looking slightly bemused and uh, trying to be polite and trying not to look horrified at the fact that we were singing song, fairly loud music. Um, and at one point, this was what put the icing on the cake for me. My colleague Stephen, who has a wonderful singing voice, um, <laughs> we were singing our finale number, um, which was, you're just too good to be true. I love you, baby, and if it's quite all right, I need you, baby. I mean, you know, the one. And uh, not very highbrow. And we'd been told to make a fuss of the birthday girl. So Stephen went over to her and started singing, you're just too good to be true. And he took her by the arm and was and sort of gently lifting, just to say, why don't you stand up and we'll dance. And she looked up at him and she said, no, no. <laughs> Mid-act. He was so embarrassed and so sort of stunned and didn't quite know what to do about being a rib rebuked quite so <laughs> emphatically. Um, he actually took her words into his singing. Um, You'd be like heaven to... No! I want a whole... And off he went singing. It made me laugh a lot. Um, and I thought, normally, at this kind of gig, we would uh, we'd pop back in afterwards and we'd introduce ourselves to the, the guests and, and just have a little chat. After that one, we thought, we're just going to take the money and run. In another room, people were playing bridge. I thought, have I really genuinely opened the door to the 1940s? It was the like of which I'd never seen. Not only were they playing bridge, not a single face on the four, of course, quartet. None of them looked like they were having any kind of fun at all. The least said about that, the better. So, backtracking a little bit, Ben had been away, uh, I think I mentioned this last time, Ben had been away in Worthing, which is down on the south coast, <laughs> south, <laughs> down on the south coast, um, putting the final touches to the mixing of the recording of the, uh, the original cast album for his musical Brass, which is due for release uh, next week, and about which more in a moment, thank you Elizabeth. And so he'd been down there, Things weren't going terribly well. Uh, they were running over time quite horribly. He was supposed to have finished the, th the Monday night, and this was the Thursday, and they were still at it. So after we finished our gig, I, I phoned him and I said, how are you getting on? Um, knowing that we had to be back in London the next morning, or he had to be back in London because we had a meeting at 10 o'clock, 9, 9.15, I think, um, where we had to do some filming for this documentary project we're working on. And uh, he said, it's not going well, we're not going to finish, I'm going to have to be doing this through the night. He said, I'll have to get... I said, you know you've got to be back in London. He said, I'll have to get a 5.30 train tomorrow morning. I said, Ben, that's ridiculous. He said, it doesn't matter, we have to do it. He was, he was very, very stressed. Um, it was going well, but it was just taking time. And so I said to him, do you want me to come and get you? Uh, <laughs> to be honest, hoping he'd say no, and knowing that I'd offered and that would be enough. Um, and... He really wanted me to go there. I, I, he and the producer, PK, had been... Uh, they get on incredibly well, but they'd been cooped up together in an attic for four days working on this, and tempers were getting frayed, they were tired, their ears were tired. Um, so I, I got home, I finished editing the podcast and started it uploading from the last episode, and about midnight I got in my car and I drove down, and I said to Ben, listen... Whatever time you finish, we'll drive back. We can still get a couple of hours kip in our own beds before we then start uh, the filming process the next morning. So I arrived just before 2 o'clock, I think, 2 o'clock in the morning on the Friday, uh, and they were still in the thick of it. They weren't looking like they were finishing any time soon. So I, uh, I got involved, and I was a fresh pair of ears, and I was able to diffuse tensions a little bit. And we worked through the night, and we worked through the night, and we finally put the finishing touches to it at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and I had, we had two and a quarter hours to get to our film shoot. So there was no time for any sleep. So we got in the car, I was exhausted, had Coca-Cola, um, 
and and drove through rush hour London into uh, central London. We had time enough to go to the house, pick up a few bits and pieces, and go straight to the recording office, the recording studio. And uh, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. We were interviewing people, and I had to be engaged, and I had to be sparky, and I had to have incisive things to say. And my brain was completely mush, and I wasn't really paying much attention to anything except, I think I'm about to die of lack of sleep. Um, it really was quite extraordinary. I'm 40 years old, I've said this before, I'm nearly 41, and the, I think my days of all-nighters are, are long behind me. Although, I proved I can get through it and not kill myself, so maybe they're not. Um, we did our filming, everything went well, ish. Um, I started to, to sort of zone out a couple of times, but I think I managed to get away with it. And then, after we'd finished, about one or two in the afternoon, it still wasn't over, still couldn't go to bed, because it was the I Knit Fandango that weekend. And this was a, this is a very small and new yarn show um, in central London, which is, they don't often happen in central London, and I really wanted to go. I'd not been before. I think it's just the second or the third year. And uh, there, were there were going to be people there that I knew. And, excuse me, I was really looking forward to... <laughs> just really big dinner. <laughs> it's a bit later in the day than it would normally be and I suspect my pasta meal might be repeating on me <laughs> quite a bit as the podcast unfolds. It's warts and all, what can I say? Um, so I went from the uh, recording session, the filming session, straight into London on, in, on the tube to go to the Inet Fandango. Now I had a really nice time. I I think I'd gone through my zombie stage and out the other side and kind of had a bit of a second wind. And I suspect that anybody that I met while I was there may have thought I was on drugs of some kind. <laughs> I'd gone into completely like zany and I was talking 19 to the dozen and everything was really, really quick and everything was amazing and isn't it fabulous? I'm loving everything. So sleep deprived, through and out the other side. And I, <laughs> yeah, to anyone who did meet me, particularly people meeting me for the first time, I can only apologise, I wasn't quite myself, and, and the pro preceding story is why. So I had a wonderful time, and I did get some stash enhancement, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I'll do that later on in the proper stash enhancement part of the show. But I had a really, really lovely time, and I did meet some lovely people. Um, it's the first time I've been out and about to a yarn show since I started doing this podcast, and it hadn't occurred to me that some people there might watch it. <laughs> um, and I know that knitting is kind of a, a fairly small fraternity, um, but it's not that small. Um, but it, it should have occurred to me that there, there might be people there. And it was really, really lovely. Um, hello, Mel from Dubai. I, I didn't take your Ravelry name, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, so I can't give you a proper shout out. But um, while I was doing the rounds, uh, this little energy ball came at me. Um, you know what, that may be unfair. I think it's a nice thing to say about somebody, but it may not be unfair, but it might be inaccurate. I don't know. I think to anybody in that state of sleep deprivation, somebody coming over to you is going to feel like a ball of energy. Um, anyway, Mel, you said hello. You said you were a fan from watching the podcast, and uh, it was really, really lovely to meet you. It was, it was quite an odd experience. Uh, I mean, you know this, I'm an actor, so I, I do deal with with people at stage doors and things, and, and sometimes people have known who I am, but that's kind of what I do professionally, and that's, that, that kind of comes with, as part of the territory. I was sort of unprepared for it as a podcaster, as a knitter, because I feel that that's, this is me as me, not me on stage being somebody else. Um, and it was bizarre to think that somebody I don't know yet, it turns out, um, would know who I was, particularly somebody like Mel, who lives in Dubai. <sighs> wow, I'm amazing. It was lovely. We had such a lovely talk, and her friend Mina, uh, who is Mina Philip, who is Mina 86, Mina 80, I'm going to do this prop. Sorry, Mina. Uh, I didn't check. Mina 89 or 86 on Ravelry, but Mina Philip, who also podcasts and does the Knitting Expat podcast, uh, she lives in Bahrain, um, somewhere over there, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, I think it's Bahrain, um, 
And uh, the three of us got chatting, and it was we had a really, really lively conversation about all sorts of things. I'd, we covered so much. Um, uh, Mina's podcast is the Knitting Expat, Expat podcast, and uh, I was aware of her. I hadn't seen it, but it, she'd been one of the things that had been uh, recommended to me on, on my YouTube list. So it was really uh, fun to to sort of go. Mel was recognising me, and I was therefore recognising Mina. Um, and we've uh, chatted a couple of times online, or are we going to be talking about some other things? Mina, I will get round to talking to you about it if you're watching this. And Mina has mentioned me on her recent episode of her podcast, so thank you for that. It was really nice. It, it was lovely to, to chat to people. I saw lots of old friends. Uh, John Dunballam of Easy Knits um, on his stall and his adorable little black and tan dachshund called Sweep, who is just so cute, so lovely. Um, now, a lot of people that I know who went to Inet Fandango um, at times when I wasn't there, I was on for a couple of days, um, have said that they didn't think it was a particularly good show. And I don't really know why that is. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it, it it's charming. It is it is a small-scale show. It's not like Fiber East or Unravel or some of the, the big shows. Um, and actually, I think that's, that is part of its charm. When you go to Unravel at the, at, in Farnham, um, I've been twice now, and I really, really like it. But everything is crammed in. More pasta. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of stalls in a very small space, and there's thousands of people, um, and that's great. But it's not particularly relaxing. There was a really nice chilled atmosphere at Inet, and uh, and there was lots of space around the edge. They had all the stalls were kind of in the middle of this great big hall, and there were places around the edge where you could sit and knit. I was only there for a couple of hours, so I didn't I didn't take advantage of that but I really actually enjoyed it I enjoyed the the vibe of it um, I enjoyed seeing people that I knew I enjoyed meeting new people so for me thumbs up it was a winner um, last weekend Saturday was a truly momentous day uh, for two reasons one it was the Eurovision Song Contest and for all of you watching in North America, you may not know what the Eurovision Song Contest is. It's massive. It's the whole of Europe and beyond. And this year, for the first time, Australia competing, putting a song uh, into a great big competition. It's, it's, it's a gay man's heaven. Um, gay men around the world love Eurovision. I don't know what it is. It's the flamboyance. It's the uh, self-expression. It's unity. It's all, all kinds of different things. Um, I don't want to go into what Eurovision is, you can all Google it, it's fine. But it was the Eurovision Song Contest. I come from a family of Eurovision Song Contest lovers, as does Ben. Um, Ben's brother and his partner Sasha were in uh, Vienna, where the contest was being held, and they're part of the Eurovision fan club and they go to all the different events. We always host a big party here. In fact, on the wall behind where the, the camera is now, we had a massive wall chart, about sort of eight feet wide and six feet tall, um, with all the flags in the countries, and we score everything. We all have scorecards and sweepstakes, and we had about 12 people come around. It was just brilliant. It always is. Uh, we, we have a thoroughly lovely time doing Eurovision and we cook for everybody and, and just have an amazing time doing it. But the other reason why Saturday was so special, and uh, this goes back to what we went through, Ben and I went through a year ago getting married, was Ireland voted yes to same-sex marriage, Southern Ireland. And this is momentous for many, many reasons. Uh, it's the first country in the world to ever vote in same-sex marriage with a, a people's referendum uh, rather than just politicians. So that was special. It was the people of Ireland that said yes. And they said yes with a massive majority. 62% said yes. Um, which does mean, of course, 38% of people are still not in favour of same-sex marriage. But that's how democracy works. And... Uh, what was amazing about it is that the Ireland, particularly the South, has always been such an intrinsically Catholic country, and the Catholic Church is quite vocal in its uh, standpoint on homosexuality and particularly same-sex marriage and a wide variety of other things. But uh, but what was it was amazing. I was I was watching the updates as the votes were coming through all day, and and when it seemed like it was going to be a landslide victory for the yes vote. Um, it became quite emotional. It reminded me of 
what happened in England and Wales when the same laws were passed here and how I felt how I felt that validated me as a gay man and as a citizen uh, and as a person in the eyes of the law um, I was watching talks on the television by people who who just had a lot of wise things to say um, I'm actually going to put a link to it there's a, a TED talk from a drag queen uh, an Irish drag queen um, and I think if anybody is interested in seeing a gay man's perspective on what it's like to live in a world where you're not accepted, um, it's brilliant. She starts off by saying, I'm 45 years old and I have never casually held hands with my partner in the street. And then goes on to explain why it's not possible for her to do so. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Wise, wise words. And I don't want... I genuinely, I don't want this uh, podcast ever to become a forum for my political views, um, but my humanitarian views are another thing, perhaps. So watch it. I'll link to it in the show notes below. It's brilliant, and it made me cry, and I nearly gave her a standing ovation alone in my living room. So that was why uh, Saturday was amazing. Um, I've never been more proud of Ireland, and now it's just time for Northern Ireland to catch up. Big time. You're the only part... Northern Ireland are the only part of the UK that still doesn't endorse same-sex marriage in law, and it's time to change that. That's it, that's it, political views out of the way, I won't do that again. Um, I think it's probably quite clear what my political views on this topic are from everything I've ever said, but that mattered. And then, uh, fast forward. Oh, of course, Sweden won the Eurovision Song Contest, you might, need, you might want to know, with a brilliant song uh, by Morn Zemlo, uh, who sang it brilliantly, it was staged brilliantly, it's a fantastic song, top winner. And of course, Sweden have a fantastic uh, record with winning the Eurovision Song Contest. ABBA, what can I say? Uh, world's biggest ABBA fan sitting right here. I have a collection of more than 400 ABBA singles in my bedroom on vinyl. <laughs> I love Abba, can't tell you what can I do um, and then uh, more recently, back to some more knitting stuff um, I work when I'm not doing all the other crazy things I do, performing and uh, writing and singing and all the rest of it I, I have a, a day job, it's a very normal day job I work in the box office of the West End Theatre selling tickets and uh, one of the staff front of house came up to me a few weeks ago and said that she wanted to get a group of people at the theatre knitting for charity uh, to knit little squares to be made into blankets for puppies at the Battersea Dogs Home. Battersea Dogs Home is a big dog pound, a big dog's home for abandoned uh, dogs and stray dogs where they have a, a huge um, remit to rehome as many of these dogs as they can. They do amazing work. Um, and you know who doesn't love helping animal charities um, and, and she asked would I be willing to teach people who've never knit before uh, how to knit so they could make these dog squares and of course I said yes absolutely and it's taken us a little while to get some scheduling but on uh, day before yesterday uh, yesterday in fact uh, yesterday, I, yesterday evening I finished my work shift a little bit earlier, took an early lunch break and finished a little bit early so I could catch all the front of house staff before they had to start work for the evening. And uh, we sat up in the, in the, in the floor and the, the Grand Circle bar um, and there must have been about 15 people all wanting to knit. Idle, who had arranged it all, she had uh, brought some really nasty acrylic fibre and some very uh, sort of boingy plastic short needles for children to learn on. Um, and everyone had a set. And we taught them casting on and knitting. There will be more to it in order to make these squares. There's combinations of knits and pearls to make little paw prints on them and stuff. Very advanced stuff for brand new knitters. So I thought, well, once people can knit, they can just keep going until they get to a square and then they can stop. Um, so we didn't worry about the pattern so much. But it was, it was so exciting. And it was a really mixed bunch of people as well. Uh, probably more boys there than girls, uh, which delighted me, of course. Um, uh, people who had never, uh, never knitted before. Uh, who, would, who would have been the oldest there? Probably someone in the mid-40s down to early 20s. Uh, a whole range of people, male, female, gay, straight, black, white. It was such 
an eclectic group of people all learning to knit, all being brought together by uh, the concentration. The tongues were out. People were struggling with how to hold things. I didn't go into the ethics of how I hold yarn or needles. It was just letting them find their way. Here's the mechanics. Put the needle in, wind the wool round, draw it through and slip it off. Um, and they really seemed to take to it. Um, a couple of people really struggled at first, but you could tell that they were going to get it. Um, and uh, some people that really surprised me really flew with it and, and looked like they'd been knitting for ages. And by the, by the end of an hour, we only had an hour, had done several rows of 20-odd stitches. Um, it, was, it was really, really gratifying. Uh, and everywhere I looked, there were people concentrating and people helping each other and showing people where, you know, where do I put this needle in, which is the hole. It was brilliant. I've never taught beginner knitters before. Um, and it was something I really quite enjoyed. The, the group was a little too large, to be, to be honest, and it was quite difficult. So I was flitting about all over the place, running to sort of help someone with a bit of hands-on, or running over to someone else to say, no, it goes in there. Well, actually, no, you want to wind it that way round rather than that way round. Um, and I could have given them answers and reasons why, but I just said, just do as I tell you. Um, we don't have the time. But at the end of the hour, people were knitting. And I got, when I got home, I got a text message later on in the evening from Idle, who'd organised it, uh, just saying that in the break, the staff who were working on, the, on that bar that night were sitting around practising their knitting. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it made me incredibly happy. Um, I, was, I was very, very proud. Uh, so that is essentially what I've been up to over the last couple of weeks. There's a lot more, obviously, um, but I don't want to bore you all. Um, now, I did mention, talking about uh, Ben's brass CD, that the CD is ready for launch. It's so exciting. This, the music is fantastic. For those of you who don't know, who are just joining us, um, Ben was commissioned by the National Youth Music Theatre, my husband, um, last year to write uh, a musical for them to perform last year. And he chose to write us the story of a group of lads in the First World War and the show is called Brass. Uh, they're a brass band who sign up to join Kitchener's army of pals and they go over to uh, France from Leeds in Northern England to fight and they get wiped out. The story is their, uh, how their women folk at home want to learn to play the instruments that their men folk have left behind in order to welcome the men triumphantly home at the end of the war, but of course they don't come back. It's incredibly moving, it's an incredibly epic story but set against the backdrop of the horrors of the First World War um, but there's so many wonderful interactions of different relationships and Ben's music is brilliant. That's not the proud husband in me, that's the musical theatre lover in me. It's a really good show. So I got very excited when the, the CD was coming together. We've finally taken delivery of all of the pressed CDs here at the house, they're not going to be ours. Um, we've got a thousand, boxes of a thousand copies um, which are, there's a wonderful launch party happening on Sunday this weekend where all the cast from Brass, they haven't heard any of it yet, they're going to be coming there and they're all getting their ball gowns and tuxedos on and we are inviting some important people from the industry to listen to it and there's going to be a showcase of five of the songs. Um, but what Ben has also done is he applied uh, a few months ago to the Arts Council to get some funding to uh, shoot a film of one of the songs. And the song from the show is called Billy Whistle, and it's a kind of standalone song, it's outside the story, where the men in the trench sing a, a song called Billy Whistle to, to keep their spirits up. And it's the story of a young man who uh, is a keen whistler, and he whistles and the birds whistle back, and he makes friends with the birds. And he goes over to France to fight, and the steam train whistles back at him. Um, and eventually he hears a whistle that he's unfamiliar with, and he leaves the trench and goes out. And it's the whistle of a, of a shell coming towards him. And, uh, and it's, it sounds like it's very depressing. It's actually a really uplifting song. It's a wonderful showstopper in the, in the piece. So we filmed this uh, and uh, we're releasing the film at the launch. It will be available on YouTube, but there's a 30 second trailer which we've released already as a teaser. And I thought you might be interested to see it. So here it is. This is the end few moments of Billy Whistle from Brass.
Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Those harmonies at the end and the, the energy of the cast, they were all so enthusiastic. It was just brilliant working with them. They're, they're a special bunch of people. Uh, so, what I want you all to do, please, is go to uh, YouTube, and I'll put the link in the box below. Um, head over to YouTube and, and just watch the clip on there. I know you've just seen it, but we want to sort of kind of make this go viral. Share it if you can, uh, make people aware of it. If you are interested in finding out a little bit more about the show or hearing more of the music or would like to uh, buy a copy of the CD, I will also put uh, uh, information in my show notes. And I don't mind at all asking you to shell out money for it because uh, it's for a really good cause. The NYMT is a charity, charitable organisation and runs on the fees of the people who perform. They, they, they pay to be involved because they get amazing training out of it. Um, but there are people who can't necessarily afford to do that. And all the money from uh, the, the cast recording of Brass is going into the NYMT Bursaries Fund to give underprivileged kids uh, an opportunity to do something amazing that they might not otherwise be able to afford to. So that's a cause very dear to my heart. I got a little bit moved as I said it. Um, so please do uh, buy a copy just to support them. And because it's really good. <laughs> Community. Uh, well, to be honest, things have... <laughs> It sounds like a bad thing to say. I don't have a great deal to say in the community section of this podcast this week. Um, except that uh, my Ravelry group is going from strength to strength. I've got over, over 600, nearly 600 members, I should say. Nearly 600 members, which is amazing. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, please start posting things. Feel free to open new threads, ask questions, chat with each other. At the moment, um, I'm trying to make it as much of a sociable environment as I can, but I get the impression that people are waiting for everything to come through me. Don't worry about that. Start it. Start conversations. Chat to each other. Um, I feel there's someone will say something and I'll respond, and that's great because we're engaging with each other, but it sort of stops there. I'd love it to sort of snowball of its own volition and uh, keep going. I've got a very dry throat today, so excuse me. And, and keep it going that way, so I urge you all, there's 600 of you nearly, so, uh, so get chatting, that'd be amazing. Um, and here on YouTube, I mean, my subscribers are going through the roof. I've got over 1,500 subscribers, which came as a big shock when I saw that, um, about a week ago when I, when I saw that I'd gone that I was approaching 1500, it was amazing. And then, then I got a little bit more of a shock, which turned out to be unfounded. YouTube does this thing. Once you get over a thousand subscribers, you may have seen it on, a, on your own or other people's channels, it stops showing you the number and says 1K subscribers. And you have to delve a little bit deep, more deeply before you see the actual number. So mine had been saying 1K for quite some time, uh, and I'd got used to seeing that. And then I logged on to my account on YouTube, and it suddenly said 2K. What? How is this possible? It's jumped like 600 subscribers overnight. It hadn't at all. Um, it had gone over 1,500, so that makes it nearer to 2,000 than to 1,000. And YouTube seems to think that that's reason enough to start saying I've got 2,000 subscribers. I would like 2,000, so if you know people who want to join in, uh, then tell them to pop over and hit subscribe. But, uh, no. It's about 1,520 at the moment, which I am delighted to have each and every one of you, and I hope you're enjoying uh, what you're seeing. So that's kind of the, all I've got to say really on community. Uh, there's been a dearth of questions uh, on the podcast, which is okay. Uh, we've been sort of been dealing with other things uh, on the Ravelry group. So, But if anyone does have any questions, there is a, a podcast questions thread especially for it, so please pop over there. Um, ask me anything you like. It doesn't have to be... Knit uh, knitting related. It can be about me as a performer, it can be about anything really, um, and I'll endeavour to answer. Um, but the one thing I would like to say, uh, community wise, is people who've been watching all of these episodes will know that one of the reasons I've started this is because I want to be able to engage with people and I also want to be able to start uh, a two way thing. Yes, I want people to buy my patterns and I want people to know they're there, which is one of the main reasons I started doing this, but I also want to be able to, to give content back to people. Uh, and one of the things I do are tutorials. You may have seen, if you subscribe already, that there are three new tutorials in uh, my channel. 
um, for double knitting techniques and uh, they're there for very good reason. The commission shawl, oh, I said the word shawl, oh well, cat's out of the bag. The commission shawl that I uh, knitted for a magazine recently, um, which I can tell you more about later, has some unusual techniques in it and in order to be writing up the pattern I wanted to be able to link to some tutorials where I show people how I do those techniques. And they're unusual because double knitting is still kind of a niche thing, it's not as widely known as I would like it to be. Um, and they're, it's only just beginning where people are really pushing the boundaries of what's possible and I'm trying to do that as much as I can with my designs for it. And I've done that, I believe, in, with some new stuff in, in this pattern for the magazine. So uh, I wanted, I want, I want people to be able to know how to do this stuff, otherwise it becomes an unknittable project. Um, so there's some stuff there, but there's also some stuff that will be helpful for people as and when I get the chance to write up the Genesis shawl, my first big orange and green shawl project pattern. When that gets written up, um, some of the stuff that you'll need to know is in these tutorials. So uh, I've shown people how to work a centered double decrease in double knitting. There are lots of tutorials out there for centered double decreases. I love the centered double decrease. Who doesn't love the centered double decrease? It's the best. For those of you who don't understand what I'm talking about, it's where you decrease three stitches into one, and uh, in case of double knitting, uh, three pairs of stitches into one pair of stitches, and it doesn't lean to the left or to the right, it brings the center stitch to the top and the other two stitches. So if you've got three, instead, I'll turn it around, it's going to be easier, instead of sort of lining up like that with one or the other in front, they have the middle stitch in front there, so the other two stitches just tuck in behind it and it looks really, really neat and tidy. It gives this wonderful prominent line of stitches going up. I love it. Obviously in double knitting you have to do it on both sides and that can be a little tricky. So there's a tutorial how to do that. Uh, there's also a tutorial for um, one over one cables, almost like the various twisted stitches. Um, you know, how you sort of twist the stitch as you knit the cable uh, and how you cross it. And that's what I use quite a lot in both Genesis and in this new piece as well. Uh, and it's not, as e it's not as difficult as you think, it's easier than it sounds, even though you're doing it in double knitting. So you're using two pairs of stitches, which is four stitches together and, and sort of crossing them over on both sides sounds horrendous. It's actually really easy to do. Uh, just a little bit of careful of slipping of stitches to reorder things before you then knit across them. Very, very simple. Do it without a cable needle? Yes. So uh, there's that. But also, and most excitingly, I'm not going to tell you which one it's for because it gives too much away, but one of my shawls um, relies on German short rows for a bit of shaping. German short rows in double knitting. Now, as far as I'm aware, this has never existed before. Um, it certainly took me a long time to figure out how to do it. I showed a little swatch in a previous episode, I believe. Um, I'm very excited. I've perfected it. Uh, the engineering took a little while, but it's really, really brilliant. It's not difficult at all. It just took a little bit of figuring out. And actually, it's quite fun to do. So. It means you can just change direction in your double knitting. You can do shaping uh, of different kinds. Oh, the possibility is going to be endless. So, and I believe I might be. People are welcome to correct me, but I'm, I might be the first person to have done it. I suspect I'm the first person to have done a tutorial for it. Um, and certainly, this is my way of doing it. Other people may do it already, but do it differently. I don't know. I don't like the term unventing. It sounds like you've stopped something from existing, so I'll say I may have reinvented it if I haven't invented it myself. But it's quite exciting to a, a knitting geek like me. It's quite exciting. <laughs> and there's a tutorial for that. So that's what I've been doing in terms of that. But what that does mean is it's putting the foundations in place for me to then start the process of writing up the Genesis shawl pattern. Um, it's going to be a long time coming, there's a lot of it, and I don't have much time at the moment. However, I'm not knitting um, a great deal at the moment because I've still got real problems with my elbows from eight hours of knitting a day for three weeks to do the, the shawl commission. And it wasn't 
it wasn't comfortable knitting either. I wasn't just sort of gently doing it. I was knitting as furiously as I can, and I've got lots of pains here and here, and some trouble on the outside. So I think it's, I was looking at this online, I think it's golfer's elbow is, is the one that's on, on the inside where a tennis elbow seems to be on the outside, I think. And people do say it can take quite a long time to recover. It will recover on its own, but I have to avoid the activity that made it happen in the first place. Of course, that's knitting. So maybe that gives me time to write up Genesis Shaw. Maybe that will be the next endeavour. I don't know. So uh, let's talk about stuff for the boys. Um, this has kind of gone quiet a little bit this week, so this isn't going to take very long. But I do want to just say uh, a big apology to Kim, who, when I was talking last time about the idea of using second-hand suits to turn them into project bags for guys, um, I couldn't remember who it was who'd said it. Well, it's Kim, who is Cinderai uh, on Ravelry, and I've learnt my lesson. I'm not going to be spelling it. It's just going to appear on screen right there, right now. Um, uh, she's from Ontario in Canada and it was her idea so thank you for that Kim a couple of other people are talking about doing things maybe with silk ties and things like that and I think some of these ideas are brilliant so if this discussion has inspired anybody to want to do this please get in touch with me I, I, let me know what you're doing and so I can tell people about it um, and send people your way in order to buy nice things I don't know I'm not saying that me saying this on the podcast is going to suddenly mean that you'll sell out of everything you know, but there may be one or two people who go, oh, I really like that, I wouldn't have known otherwise, in which case I've helped, it makes me happy. Now, stash enhancement. I've actually got some this time, I'm really excited. Um, stash enhancement. At Inet Fandango, um, I can't go near John Dunballam's stall it seems, without buying something. Um, he has such wonderful colours and some really nice bases as well. But he started doing something really fun. I'm not quite sure what he calls the range. I'll have to do some research or maybe ask him. But uh, he has a, a range of skeins that he doesn't dye fully. What he does is he, uh, he dyes about one third of the circumference of the skein when it's stretched out. And so you, what you get is two-thirds of the skein circumference is natural and one-third is the colour that he's chosen to dye. And of course it bleeds beautifully from that colour into the natural colour. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, I couldn't resist. I've gone for black, which gives you so many colours of grey as well. It's fabulous. Look at this. Isn't that just delicious? You can see... Do you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to... I'm going to open it up so you can see a little bit more. It's in his, uh, it's the same base as his Deeply Wicked stuff, which is 100% Superwash Merino, and it's a fingering weight, and it is uh, four ply, of course, 100 grams, 400 meters. So it's good, generous yardage. Um, but look at that. The grey has a kind of purplish hue to it, which is being slightly accentuated by these lights. It's not quite as purpley as that but the black is really rich and dark uh, and deep. You've got such wonderful juxtaposition between the two. And if I open up the skein, if I can, it's very well wrapped, John, you'll see how much of it is natural and how much... There you go. So it's, it's nearly half, I guess, by the time it's bled out to the sides, but it's just Lovely. That's going to give some really gorgeous striping effects, um, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait to get it um, knitted up into something. I'm, I'm formulating the idea of, of some kind of short row, one skein shawl project, because I really want to, to do something that will accentuate these, these stripes. Just trying to get that skein back into one coherent piece. Yes, I think that will do it, don't you? Look at that, live skein wrapping on a podcast. It's lovely, it's really, really nice. It's, um, superwash can tend to be a little bit less soft and squishy than some, but this is still really, really nice. I'm very much looking forward to working with that. Thank you, John. And then, Volmeiser, 
Josh Volmeiser were there and uh, they uh, had a lot of seconds essentially, a lot of stuff that they, they wouldn't normally sell at their full price. Now Volmeiser can tend to be on the pricey side. Um, there's a lot of it, you often get 150 grams to a skein rather than 100 grams, but you can end up paying sort of like 25, 30 pounds for a skein. Um, the colours are so fantastic and everyone loves Volmeiser, um, as do I. But what they had was all the kinds of stuff where maybe there were some knots, maybe in, in a skein it broke and they had to, to tie it together so um, it wouldn't all be in one piece, reduced price. Or maybe the colourways didn't come out quite as standard, so they're, they're slightly different. Um, and they were selling them at I, everything there, it was basically £13, which is amazing. I bought two skeins. Um, they're from the nobody's perfect, it says on there, which means that something's not quite right. And I absolutely love them. I'm going to show you these two colours together because I am going to use them together. They're kind of eccentric as a partnership, but I have a really, really kind of eccentric idea for them as well. And I think they work really nicely together. So we've got this amazing uh, sea greeny turquoisey colour, which is called Hamam. Um, both of these are marked on the label with an F, I don't know if you can see there. And the F is for father, which means colour, means the colour wasn't quite as standard. That's Hamam, which is this fairly, it's, it's got some depth to it, but it's pretty, it's essentially one colour. It's not showing up on, on camera very well. It's quite a vivid sea turquoisey green, and it looks mostly blue on, on screen. So if you're not seeing that properly, I apologise for that. But then there's this one as well, which is called Single Malt, and it really is the colours that you'd get in the bottom of a rich whiskey glass. It is absolutely lovely and it goes through quite a number of shades a little bit that's probably a bit more accurate in the lighting there so the two of them together I think are are lots of fun and the lady who works for Volumizer was was trying to say but they both have the same kind of uh, contrast there's not so much the you know, same saturation so there wouldn't be much contrast between the two it's like that contrast enough for me that She's right, of course, and in colour theory, you, you sort of do want to have a deep colour contrast with a light colour, and these are both quite saturated. Um, however, I like it. My eye says yes, my brain doesn't need to care. So that's my stash acquisitions from the iNet Fandango, and I'm really excited about getting started with all of them, but I've got too much in the meantime that I need to finish. Um, and... That, of course, brings me on to my whips. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to show you anything. It's all the same. Gilt socks, did a few more rows. I did actually, on one of my fractal scarves on Sunday, when I went to my monthly cake and craft uh, meeting with some friends, I did quite a lot of knitting on uh, one of the fractal scarves. Um, it's the, the DK weight yarn one. So it is, it's coming along. I, did, I, I probably knitted about mm, that much of it about that wide um, and I'm paying for it elbows wise so that's probably all I'll be doing knitting wise for a little while um, nothing else has changed so there's nothing else we're talking about and I have no FOs either so apologies for that but life and elbows get in the way so um, I've been so much looking forward to sharing this piece of information with you I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to this. The <laughs> I was going to put this in the stash enhancement, I was going to put it in the community. No, this is special. This is really, really special. And uh, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago now, I was chatting or messaging online with Joyce, who is Zoe Knit Girl on Ravelry and Aussie Yarning as a podcaster. I've spoken about her before. Um, Everyone who watches this will know who I'm talking about, but I'm giving her her full credits. And she has a lovely uh, Etsy store as well, Aussie Yarning at uh, Aussie Yarning dot Etsy .com. And she was saying to me because I've been banging on about stuff for the boys and stitch markers always tending to be girly things, and she said uh, she sent me a message saying, "Well, what kind of stuff would boys like in a stitch marker?" And I really didn't know, so I opened it to my Ravelry group and we had the Stitch Markers for the Boys thread, which got a little bit um, <laughs> a little bit unorthodox in some of its content. Thank you, William. Um, 
check it out if you haven't already, you'll know what I mean. And uh, it was really interesting. A lot of people thrashed, down, uh, thrashed out a lot of ideas for what could be useful. So I was hoping that Joyce would find this useful for making some stitch markers, which would be stuff for the boys. Um, and she did say, she asked me for my address because she said she'd put something together and she'd really like to send me something, which was the sweetest thing in the world. Um, bear in mind, she lives in Australia, I live in England. That's a hell of a long way. And she wanted to send me something. So I said, yes, please, and I will feature it on the podcast or I will give it away. And she said, no, 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 you, you keep it or give some stuff away. It doesn't matter. Um, she posted me this parcel it arrived about a week ago I was so excited I saw it I took it to work this, uh, this parcel arrived all the way from Australia I'm moving it quickly so that you can't see my address or hers <laughs> I think that's only fair um, and I thought well that's quite a large box I, was, I thought well, maybe maybe one needs to, to have a large box when one is shipping internationally from Australia um, I took it to work because I was on my way out the door when I found it and I opened it when I had a break at work. And, oh my word, it's like an Alad Aladdin's cave of loveliness. It genuinely, genuinely is. I opened it up, and the delight on my face, I've opened it up now, uh, the delight when I saw what was inside was so amazing. Joyce had been asking about what would make good stitch markers for stuff for the boys. Well. The most literal interpretation of that possible is stitch markers that say stuff for the boys. <laughs> I love these. Joyce and I love you for making them. They are just absolutely brilliant. Now you may be saying, what's that one in the middle? I could not believe it. If you look very closely, it says do you know what? I'll get it out. I'll get it out of the packet so you can see exactly what it is. Not only do they say stuff for the boys, but this one says... I've got to try and get it to focus. Let me see if tapping on the screen will help. Doesn't seem to. It says Sockmetician with a little picture of my Drakkar socks. And it also says across the top, OSAT, one stitch at a time. These are just brilliant. They're little resin things. I don't know how she, she explained to me how she makes it. I still can't imagine that this is something you can do in your bedroom or your living room, but it seems apparently you can. They are just fabulous. And they're such a good set because we've got five in this set here and one of them is different. So that you know it's brilliant if it's one for the start of the row or around um, for finding out where you are when all the others can be the same. They're really lightweight. They're nice and smooth, so they're not going to snag. Um, they're probably good enough for four, four and a half mil. I haven't checked, um, but they're just absolutely brilliant. That's not all. That's one. Then there are some that come uh, sockmetician ones on their own. Here's here's a couple which are much larger sockmetician ones and these have got little clippy markers on so you can attach them without having to slip them over the needles you can actually clip them on which is brilliant or you could put this on a project bag or something like that and they don't just say sockmetician on the back turn it around in green they say stuff for the boys what this means i've got my own range <laughs> how amazing joyce i cannot tell you how much i love these um, there's another one. She sent me some of her um, stuff that she has already, which these are just delightful because she's Australian. She's got some lovely Australian catchphrases. Fair dinkum, mate. And her own catchphrase, which I can't find at the moment, uh, on another clippy one saying, she'll be right, mate, which is just brilliant. She says that at the end of her podcast and it's, uh, uh, it, she'll be right, mate. It's brilliant. Uh, and it's so very, very Joyce, and I love it. So there's that. Another set of a full set of two sets of uh, stitch markers there. Another big sockmetician one. A little she'll be right, mate. One. Um, these I love. This is a different set. 
for the OSATers among you, one stitch at a time. There you go, OSAT. <laughs> That's my own hashtag in a stitch marker with my feet wearing my socks. How cool is this? This is this makes me the most narcissistic person in the world. There's always been a tendency for that in me, Joyce, but you are facilitating it big time. Um, then there's uh, Good Day, mate, which is, I believe, one of her other standard fare. And sock petition ones, uh, more of them. So there's this many sock petition ones. The big ones, the clippy ones that say sock petition, there's this many of them. There's her own branding ones that have Australia on them and uh, her Aussie yarning logo. So thank you for that. That's very special too. And a couple more there. Uh, and there's some more one stitch at a time ones. I mean, Joyce, I can't, it's just... So much stuff, so much time and care must have gone into making, just thinking up what to put on them, let alone the planning and the making. And I've got, you know, all of this on the back. We've got Joyce Fisher and all her details here. I'm going to link to all of this anyway, because you can go to aussieyarning.com and her Etsy store um, and her Ravelry group. And it says at the bottom, remember, she'll be right, mate. Um, this is one of the sweetest things anyone has ever done, and uh, clearly, I would be a terrible person if I said these are lovely and having them all. Um, I certainly will be keeping probably one of each, um, but that means there's going to be a lot left over. So what I want to do, I, I said to Joyce, I wanted to do a giveaway for them because it's just so amazing to have some of these things uh, going out to other places in the world where people can see the amazing things that Joyce has made. Um, so, <laughs> initially, I thought, well, I'll do a giveaway on, on the podcast and we'll just have lots of prizes and it'd be great. I'm actually not going to do that. I think that's not actually fair to Joyce. This is such an amazing collection of stuff and there's so much of it. And I am so, so grateful and so proud uh, to have been able to sort of help catalyze it and I'm just so happy that Joyce is such an amazing person. All the superlatives, you get what I mean, um, that I thought I wanted to do her justice. And so instead of one massive giveaway, which is just kind of one hit wonder and then it's done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give away one packet. So it could be a single one like that, or it could be a set like that. One per episode on this podcast until they're gone. Until they're gone, until the, until the ones I want to keep are the only ones left. and. There's plenty there, it's going to take us a while. And what I'm going to do is it's just going to be a rolling thing. There will be one given away to somebody who has posted something in my group on Ravelry. Something that maybe made me laugh, made me smile, made me think, made me weep, made me remember, uh, made me learn. Um, just something interesting, something that appeals to me and I will choose, it could be across any of the threads there, it's not going to be a specific thread, you won't know you're doing it uh, until you know you've done it and I will just be rewarding somebody, uh, I'm assuming that everybody who posts stuff in the group will be uh, podcast watchers, there's probably no one there who isn't, so I will be doing that for one person every week until it's gone. So Joyce Mwah. from London to Australia thank you so so much it was I, I love them and I just love how literal that is stuff for the boys they are brilliant and thank you that leads us on to our final section for today um, which is the uh, giveaway results that I, for the giveaway I set up last time. Oh, it's not, not quite. Aha, I've got two more to go. Um, the giveaway results for last time, which was a chance to win one of my double knit patterns. Um, so I will administrate that. What I've done is I've locked the thread. What I'd asked people to do was say why double knitting appealed to them, either as a new knitter, as a new double knitter who, who thinks oh, it's, it's amazing because this, and this is what makes me want to try it, or an experienced double knitter who says, I love it because it's this. Um, 
So I, I opened this thread, I've now locked it, and I've randomly chosen uh, a number for the winner. But I just thought I'd share some of the things that people were saying. There's quite a number of reasons why people love DK, and why wouldn't you? If, if, if it is something that you haven't yet started uh, thinking about, and there are loads of people who are saying, you've inspired me to, to want to learn, but have you learnt it yet? Mm, come on, I urge you, let's pick up those needles, pick up the tutorials, pick up those two yarns, figure it out and get going because you'll have an amazing time. And here are just some of the reasons why. Um, seven people said it was because it was very warm, which it is because it's double the thickness. Eight people said they love double knitting because it's reversible, which is great. Um, four people picked up on the fact that you can do the amazing colour work with no stranding. Um, double knitting has, has the stretch of single knitting probably more actually because each stitch uses a little bit more wool because of the fact that they're spaced out on the needles. Technicality we can go into another time. Um, but there's no stranding at all so it's really really stretched. It's not stiff and rigid like uh, some fair art or stranded work can be. Uh, seven people like the fact that there's no wrong sides. Now that's not the same as it being reversible. It's not my camera, apologies for that. Um, the fact there's no wrong sides just means everything's hidden away, which is brilliant. The fact it's reversible means you can turn it inside out. Subtle distinction, but a distinction nonetheless, I think. Um, akin to that, it was what ten people said. This is probably the, the most uh, popular reason for loving DK was that the two sides are positive and negative of each other in terms of colour. Um, what is black on one side is white on the other, what's white on one side is black on the other. Um, and that was really, really popular choice. Ten people said that. Two people picked up on the fact that you don't really need to block double knitting. Uh, I've not blocked any of my uh, scarves at all, or my hats, or anything like that. Uh, it comes off the needles, it's already flat, it's a totally non-curl. Um, stocking stitch will curl, but because it's two layers of stocking stitch, kind of they're just backing onto each other. They stop each other. They prevent each other from curling completely. You can block it if you want to sort of stretch things out, or if you want anything to be a per perfect shape or size. You can, and I have blocked my latest shawl. Um, it, it needed it for different reasons, but uh, you don't need to, which is great. One person says it's virtually windproof. And I think that's true. Did you just hear that click? That was me. I snapped my thumb. I'm so sorry. Oh, I did it again with my finger. I have a bundle of habits. Um, it is kind of true that it's windproof, not necessarily because of its denseness, but because uh, how double knitting works, it doesn't kind of stack up just like that. The stitches sort of stack up half a stitch off from each other. So it means that there's often the opposite yarn showing in the hole and the opposite hole showing in the yarn, meaning that this, the holes are generally plugged by other bits of yarn, which can mean it's a bit more windproof, which is great. Um, two people love the mathematics of it. They love the mechanics of how it works, and it appeals to their scientific brains. Hello, I'm one of those. I'm not one of those two, but I, I join you in that group. Seven people commented on the thickness of it, um, which is kind of, it's not the same as it's being warm. They like the, the sturdy nature of it. Two people said um, that there's not much finishing. I think that's different from no blocking, so I didn't lump those together. It's so easy for weaving in ends. You sort of don't need to. You just sort of thread them into the into between the two layers. And if it's a, a grippy yarn, that's it. It gets caught. It felts itself inside. There's no real weaving in to do. Um, and certainly no hiding of it, the way you can sometimes have to choose exactly where you weave on a single face project. You don't have to worry about that with DK, which is brilliant. Um, two, uh, three people just talked about the beauty of the finished objects you can make. Um, Audrey, poem lady, uh, was the only person who said this, but it's such a lovely thing I thought I'd pick it out. She just said, I love it because it's magic. It is actually magic. Double knitting is magic. Um, and four people talked about how awe-inspiring knitting of this kind can be and how uh, you sort of basically they talk about the bragging rights for you as a knitter in a in a room full of knitters sometimes being the only double knitter can make other knitters go oh, that's amazing which is naughtily a very nice feeling it is nice to have people impressed by what you do i'm not gonna lie i'm an actor it's how i'm wired i like people being impressed <laughs> so 
Drum roll, please. Uh, I'm sure you're wondering uh, who the lucky winner is. Now this is completely at random, and the lucky winner was number 19 on the thread, which is Jan from New Jersey. Congratulations, Jan. Um, uh, she's Jan Any 20 or, or Yanna. 23 Lee on Ravelry. I'm not quite sure how that's intended to be pronounced, but I wanted to share with you uh, Jan's full post. I have never knitted a double knitted project, and I'm not sure how well I will do, but I am intrigued by it. One, I love that you do not have to worry about the strands. Two, I love the double thickness. Three, I love the idea of not having to block your project. Four, I love that there is not a backside. Five, I love the negative and positive side. I'm a photographer and this really appeals to me. That's very interesting. I like that point. Six, but most of all, I love the beauty of the finished object. Um, and the pattern that she wants to make, uh, which will be winging its way to as a gift very soon, is Perplexus, which was my very first double knit scarf. It's the one with the diamonds on it. Uh, thinking about it, I'm going to be editing in a photograph of it right now so you can see it and you can see how it's got uh, these sort of diamond patterns showing up in the squares she says I'm so intrigued by the way the squares pop in and out a feast for my eyes and brain so Jan Perplexus will be winging its way to you and congratulations I'm not going to do a full-on giveaway this week uh, in this episode I'm going to have the ongoing one for Joyce's fabulous stitch markers that's ongoing, I'll do another full-scale one uh, another time. But uh, thank you to everyone who took part. It was fascinating reading all of your replies. And uh, that topic is now locked because the giveaway is over. But feel free to discuss the benefits of double knitting elsewhere on the forum. Lovely. Which leads me finally to Historic FO. Now this, I, I wanted to talk about this as a Historic FO and I thought First of all, should I? Because it's actually a pattern. It is one of my own patterns, but it's one that I haven't released. Um, and that's purely through time. And I think I should, because I want to get it ready for this winter. It's a hat. And I've called it heliocentric. Now, we live in a heliocentric uh, galaxy. Solar system. Not galaxy at all. Um, solar system, meaning that the sun is the centre, heliocentric. Uh, the sun is the centre of our, of our solar system and we all rotate around it. I was toying with the idea, I actually put this together for a, a, a possible commission for a magazine and they didn't take it, but I made the hat anyway. And I, I'm really pleased with it. It's, it's a lot of fun, it's a little bit bonkers. But I wanted to see, what if, what if you could knit the entire solar system and wear it as a hat? <laughs> Don't worry, it's not three-dimensional planets, it's not stuffed balls full of stuff. No, 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 it's not that. This is heliocentric. And I really, really do love it. Um, it's called heliocentric because the sun is there in the centre of the hat. Uh, and actually the sun itself just kind of hides all of the decreases in the crown uh, decreases section there. They're all kind of hidden as part of how the pattern forms itself around making the sun, and I love that. It's really good fun. And I wanted to include all of the planets, so we have in their correct order and distance from the sun, we've got Mercury there, and Venus, and Earth, and Mars, and then we further round we have somewhere else we've got Saturn with its rings you know this you get this right this is just the initials and Uranus and the massive giant Jupiter so that's why it's huge they are all not to scale but the larger ones are the larger letters I, I thought it through quite carefully uh, Neptune out on the outskirts of our solar system and a whole variety of uh, stars, little ones and big ones and medium-sized ones just to give it a little bit of life and to, to keep the two sides of the fabric locked together over those large passages of what would otherwise be one colour. Now the joy of this is that some of the letters, like an M for example, 
or uh, a U, anything like that, they're entirely symmetrical. So what we're talking about being positive and negative in double knitting, um, on the other side, those letters would be exactly the right way. Um, what you would get normally with E for Earth, for example, is on the inside you would get a backwards E. With a little bit of careful charting, where is my E? There it is, also the right way round. How exciting, just to prove to you, I'm no jiggery pokery. E there and E there. Um, so that's that's the joy of this hat. So even the, even the massive great big J is round the right way. You can do it. This is um, there's a discussion in the double knitting group on Ravelry at the moment over what we call this kind of technique. Whether we call it non-reversible double knitting, and people seem not to like that. So I came up with the phrase non-mirrored double knitting, and people seem to like that because it's not normally the two sides are a mirror image of each other. Here they're not. The V clearly is. It's just normal. But some of the letters you need to work out a little bit more carefully than that and uh, it's all in the pattern for this. So I used some really, really uh, cheap 100% wool yarn, I can't remember what it was, it was just really, really cheap, nothing special at all, it just came in these great colours, this fantastic midnight blue and the gold for the hat. Um, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to include as much realism as I could, <laughs> what am I talking about, realism? But as much as I could. And uh, when I was a kid, we had nine planets in our solar system, and one of them was Pluto. And since I grew up, I used to love Pluto. Um, it's been downgraded. It's now just a dwarf planet. So if you notice, it's the furthest one away, but if you notice, you go all the way around the base of the hat, there's no mention of Pluto. Now, this saddened me. I wanted it to be an accurate reflection of the solar system, but of course, Pluto is no longer a planet, so it shouldn't be included. However, for the purists in in us, who really like Pluto. Because of this non-mirrored stuff, another careful bit of charting, on the inside of the hat, right at the edge, there's a P for Pluto. This gives me so much joy. So there he is on one side and not on the other. So it's just the blue yarn doing the work there. <laughs> So you can choose whether you, uh, you want to acknowledge Pluto's existence or you want to represent the solar system as it is. Um, it's a, it's a one-size-fits-all kind of hat. It's kind of a, a large-sized um, beanie sort of thing. You, could, you can wear it with a little, you know, up there with a, maybe a little bit of slouch to it. Um, you know, it's not, not how I would choose to wear a hat. I don't think, it, I don't think that suits me. Um, I've got the ears for it, um, but you can choose to wear it like that if you want to. It's really, really warm, however, because of the double thickness. It's a DK weight yarn anyway, um, and it's really, really warm and fabulous, and I love it. Um, so I will be writing this up. I've got all the notes, I've got all the charts. I just need to get off my backside and do it. So that is my historic finished object, and that is heliocentric, a hat coming to you soon. Um, and I hope you enjoy when it comes out, I'd, I'd be really interested to know um, if people will want to knit this. It's a, it's a fun project and it makes a fun hat, I think. So there we are. I think I've warbled on enough. It's later in the day than I would normally want to be uh, recording this podcast. We've had meetings all day today with the producer of the documentary that we're making on, which I still can't talk about, um, to see how we're going to be working through it over the course of the next eight months. Um, it's going to be a long, long project, a long process. And that's taken up most of my day today. But I really wanted to get this out because I, um, I'm i aware that I'm sort of shifting the goalposts a little, sort of a day later each time, and that's going to just get out of sync. So uh, I now want to get on and start editing this so that you can watch it. Um, thank you so much for sticking around. Thank you so much for being part of my sockmetician crazy world. I really enjoy talking to you. Um, and... Although this podcast is now a finished object, remember that life itself is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. See you soon.